Hello and welcome to the Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things that are beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find me on Instagram and on Ravelry as a sour telling, that's a sour telling. And I'm really happy to be bringing you video number two of um, my new endeavour. So thank you very much for joining me. In this episode, I'll chat to you about what I've been knitting on recently, share a little bit of mending um, and have a little um, ponder about the beauty of the everyday. Um, and then I'll, I'll wrap the video up with, with a chat and a meditation on an essay that I'll, I'm happy to be sharing with you today. Firstly, I'll just mention the name of this podcast, which is The Crimson Stitchery. Um, that's a moniker that I made up to give my lair <laughs> and my little spot on the sofa here. Um, there's also a pink rug and there's a pink um, footstool and I've got loads of these cushions that are all in reds and pink. So that's kind of where I thought the name The Crimson Stitchery could come from. Um, there's also a series of books that I really loved reading when I was a child about um, between seven and 11 years old, which were called The Fairy Books by Andrew Lang. Um, and every book, it was they were, they were quite thick. They were sort of, you know, yay high, they were about an inch thick. And uh, it was just collected fairy stories. Unfortunately, I don't think that he gave the source um, of each individual story. But anyway, the point being that there was the blue fairy book, the yellow fairy book, and there was the crimson fairy book, which, um, I really always wanted to be my favourite because I liked the title, but the stories in it actually didn't love as much as I think the blue fairy book was my favourite. So um, yeah, the Crimson Stitchery. So it's really just my living room. That's what I'm calling the Crimson Stitchery. Um, I play a few instruments and, and my partner's also a musician. So on the other side of the camera here, you have, you know, the music studio and, and the office. <laughs> I say, you know, with a more than a pinch of salt because we live in a pretty small flat. So it's basically every corner of the room has got its own name. And this is mine. So um, I, I'll just mention what I'm wearing at the moment, which is this bright red lace cardigan um, that I knitted a few years ago now. I, I tried to keep up for the last three years this idea of making a cardigan in the autumn so that it would be all ready to wear in, in December when um, you know there's a lot of visiting and parties and, and festivities, uh, at least here in London, um, there are. So it's this, it's this red lace cardigan with this really simple, uh, Shetland horseshoe horseshoe lace um, and I think it's really interesting with this pattern how it recedes between the foreground and the background because when you're really close up to it you really see these this horseshoe shape um, which is of course what the pattern gets its name from this kind of lily of the valley cup shape of flower but when the pattern recedes it inverts so instead of having the roundness of the horseshoe shape, you get the inverted Vs instead, um, which I think is really interesting, the way that the, the, the patterning, the texture and the interplay of shadows in the fabric creates, so not quite an optical illusion, but, but something, you know, along, along that way. So that's that. Um, yeah, a few years old now, still going really strong, still a favorite garment. So, um, finished objects. I'm really happy to be sharing with you my red brick socks. I mentioned these last episode when I had one and I've now got two. Um, and it's got my trusty piece of cardboard inside the sock instead of a sock blocker and the cardboard's a bit goes off at a funny angle so it's gone like that. But um, they're a really lovely textured pattern. And the thing about these socks is that I didn't knit them in so-called normal sock yarn, i.e. four ply or fingering weight. Um, I made them in a heavier, heavier yarn intended for socks, um, created by the Nordic, I've been instructed, Nordic, not Scandinavian brand, Novita from Finland. And so it contains 25% polyamide. Um, polyamide is the, the name of, um, is the technical name for synthetic 
fibres such as nylon, so nylon is a brand name, polyamide is the name of fibre. Um, so it's heavier than so-called normal sock yarn. And I was initially a little bit concerned about that because I was worried that the fabric it would create would be far too thick for my shoes and just kind of feel really, you know, lumpy or, or something like that. But actually it's not the case at all. The fabric is lovely. It feels really, it's dense, but um, it feels just really strong and warm and I feel very secure in these socks. <laughs> so I wrote the pattern myself. Uh, it's a me design and the pattern's a really nice interplay of twisted stitches on a pearl background um, and I'm actually considering working up into a pattern because I find that it's it was just such a lovely project to work on it was really quite grounding and I think because there was a small and very easy stitch pattern meant that you were kind of connected enough to the work to not get bored um, but it wasn't too challenging and it wasn't too absorbing so I found that I really love the look of really intricately cabled and lace sock designs but what I tend to do is I tend to just save them all as bookmarks on my computer and then they just never end up getting knitted and what I myself find that I knit are the most simple simple so-called boring, if you like, sock projects, but ones that I can take out and about with me and, you know, work on out of the house rather than, you know, sitting in a really focused way, either here or, you know, elsewhere in, in, in silence. Um, those kind of projects tend to languish and it's these kind of easier slash intermediate-ish projects that actually hold my attention, which is surprising in some ways. Um, so yeah, I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts on sock yarn. What are your favourite kinds of sock yarns? Um, have you made socks using slightly heavier DK weight sock yarns? Um, or do you always stick to four ply? Um, or would you be interested in experimenting? Um, so yeah, that's my red brick socks. More on those to come in future videos, I think. But um, let me know what you think. My next thing to share with you, next piece of knitting, is a scrap sock. So again, I was working on this last week. Um, let's try and get that focus. And I've now finished one. And the only thing about scrap socks is that you always have a million ends to weave in. Like there's three, there's three ends here and it's only the toe. Um, so that's that. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that now because I did chat about it in detail last week but I'm on to the second second sock now um, and I've done the heel. Done the heel and now I've just started working up on the gusset decreases so those are those, my scrap socks. Um, the next work in progress I'm going to share with you is one that I just started last night. Where is it? In my handy knitter's basket. Um, so I haven't got very far in it at all. Um, so I finished those red brick socks at the beginning of last week. Um, now I'm back on the scrap socks I'm trying to finish this week. And quite often I find that I have a larger and a smaller project on the go at once. Um, so in this in this case and quite frequently it's a pair of socks and either a sweater or some kind of gift or um yeah generally generally two projects although I tend to mostly work on one at a time with success um so I've just I've just cast on so it's 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 going to be a tunic and it's going to be a lacy kind of wide tunic with almost with kind of wide almost on the verge of bell sleeves um, coming out here. And the pattern is from the book, The Vintage Shetland Project by Susan Crawford. Um, that I was really pleased to be able to crowdfund quite a few years ago. And um, so happy, so, you know, so happy that, that Susan completed the project and is still, and is still developing it in many ways. Um, and I, I believe that Susan's just had a, sorry, the book's by Susan Crawford. Um, and you know you you can follow her 
online in, in all of the various places. I'm sure you've heard of her <laughs> already. And I think that um, the project is having an anniversary recently. So Susan's been sharing a lot of the photographs from her photo shoots and so on um, on her Instagram page. So um, do have do have a look at that if you've not heard of it. Um, even though I'm sure you have. Personally, I'm not really an avid colour work knitter. I much prefer thinking about texture, hence cardigan, um, and thinking about shape, which is what really drew me to this project because um, rather than being like a kind of fitted little pullover or vest, um, it, it, it's a shaped garment involving different textured and lace stitches. So that's the one that I'm doing. And um, so I cast this on last night and the yarn that I'm using is, is this stuff. Um, I really like the, the yarn label actually. I'll just pop that up there so that you can see it, um, if it will focus, there we go. Um, it kind of reminds me, it's a bit crumpled this one, it kind of reminds me of um, Art, Art Nouveau, Art Deco architecture, early 20th century architecture, especially with this mirror um, and this kind of tile motif. And I purchased the yarn for my birthday last year when we took a trip to Porto in Portugal. And I found this little, um, really lovely haberdashery in the, in the middle of the city, um, which was, was actually in, I think it was in an Art Nouveau building. It's an early 20th century building. And whether or not it had the original shop fittings, I'm not entirely certain. But all of the yarn was displayed in original period um, shop furniture. So they had the big, you know, glass haberdashery cabinets um, all around the room uh, at, at counter level. And then they had all of the original wooden shelving that they had all this lovely yarn displayed on. And um, there's not, um, so there's not tons and tons of information from this company available online compared to other Portuguese brands. But I was told by the, by the shop, um, shop assistant that it was pure Portuguese wool. So they haven't listed the brand or anything like that. Um, it's worsted spun, it's, it's four ply weight, but it's, um, it's, many, it's many plies together, I would say at least, yeah, probably, um, probably at least eight, eight individual plies. So it's very slick. Um, but it's it's kind of a little bit airy and plump as well so it's actually really lovely to work with and they had really amazing colors in the shop and it was really really difficult to pick one <laughs> but i've picked this dark claret burgundy dark reddish wineish kind of color um which i'm really happy with and i think it's going to be a lovely jumper i expect to work on it through the spring and then it'll get to summer <laughs> and I'll have to put it at the back of the cupboard. Um, but I think it's 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 gonna be a really nice project to work on. So I'm really happy to be knitting with last year's birthday yarn. My birthday's in the summer. Um, and that that's something that I, I do quite frequently. I'll 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 buy myself some some yarn for my birthday and that will sort of be my main yarn purchase for the year and then I'll I'll make throughout the year I'll maybe buy like small, small little bits for projects as I'm working on. Um, I'm also making this ongoing concerted effort to work through my stash that my friends know all about. <laughs> so I won't go into that there, but suffice it to say that I have been knitting for, you know, more than half my life at this point. Um, I've been knitting for at least 15 years. And in that amount of time, Things accumulate, things accumulate, you know, things you've bought, treats you've bought, sale purchases, gifts, other people clearing out, you know, things that are literally you're rescuing out of the bin, like, it's very easy to amass materials, <laughs> especially over such a long period of time, so that's something that I, I probably will revisit as a theme um, in my videos as time goes on. So, um, the last thing that I'll share with you before I move on um, to mending is a little swatch. Um, I, just, I just suddenly thought, do you know what, I make so much stuff out of fine yarns, I just wanted to make something out of something chunky so that it would grow quite quickly, but I've only got as far as, as knitting the swatch 
And again, talking about materials accumulating, it's out of this um, yarn, but I, I purchased, oh, Oh, well over 10 years ago, well over 10 years ago, at least 12 years ago, because it was on clearance. So it was it was crazy, crazy cheap. Um, and it's in this lovely forest green colour that's, that's going to be a really nice, nice addition to my, my winter wardrobe. So I've just got a swatch. Um, I think I'm going to be recreating a jumper that I made for my sister a couple of years ago. Actually around the time that I made this one, I made a jumper for my sister for Christmas too. And um, I've... I've been trying to steal it back off her ever since I gave it to her, <laughs> if I'm completely honest with you. And I'm really unsubtle. If you're watching this, sis, Keep your wardrobe locked. Um, <laughs> I'm always like, oh sis, how are you getting on with that jumper I made you? <laughs> Do you wear it often? Oh, I noticed that you like that jumper. Do you also wear the jumper that I made you quite a lot? She's always like, oh yeah, yeah, I really like that jumper. I wear it all the time, it's, it's really cool, I really like it. And I'm always like, oh damn it, wrong answer. <laughs> so yeah, I've got to make myself my own version out of forest green, but more on that anon. Okay, let's continue to mending. So, thank you so much for everybody's comments on mending on my first video. I so appreciated all of your thoughts on mending, from mending mountain, to mending basket, to mending pathway. <laughs> Um, it was such a joy to read all of your comments and something that I'm hoping that we can do together is maybe use, um, maybe use my video as a tool to motivate all of us to do a little bit of mending. It's definitely working for me because I was like, oh, I've got to do the second episode. Let me make sure that I finish something so that I can share it. So I wonder also if, um, perhaps you might watch the video and then either during or, or afterwards go and revisit your mending pile, maybe one object at a time. So on that note, what I've got to share with you for my mending this week is a tea towel. <laughs> I don't know if um, how much tea towels are used in other countries, but in the UK, a tea towel is a piece of linen or cotton um, that's used in the kitchen to dry dishes with and just as a general handy household cloth. And they're generally mass produced. Um, sometimes they're made of more of a toweling um, waffle kind of weave. This one is a very plain, plain weave cotton. Um, yeah, they're generally mass produced. But interestingly, there's a kind of polarity in the tea towels that are available on the market. So on the one end, there's the five for five pounds side of things um, that you'll get in, you know, general homeware store. On the other end of the tea towel spectrum are individual screen printed or sometimes just printed in small batches um, tea towels which are available at art galleries and museums and used as one-offs by artists. And those are really, really expensive. <laughs> um, they're often really beautiful, but they're not very practical. They're a really nice way to have a piece of, you know, interesting print or design available in your kitchen for you to look at in a domestic context as opposed to hung up on the wall. You can also hang them up on the wall, I would say, especially the artist screen printed ones. And they can be really, really, really gorgeous. But um, I, oh, and then you've also got the kind of commemorative occasional tea towels, which I think are quite common as well. But sort of between the polarities of like the individual artist's version and the almost nondescript, um, basic, simple options that are probably, probably going to see you through more occasions in your life and probably, work a lot harder for you and do a lot more for you <laughs> than those artists. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm saying this in a, in a slightly facetious manner because it, it's the kind of thing where, you know, you go into the, you know, the, the, the gallery shop of, of a lovely gallery in, in a city and you're kind of wandering around the shop and you're like, or I'm like, I should, I should speak for myself. I'm like, oh, that was an amazing exhibition. Maybe I'll purchase a postcard for, you know, 60p. <laughs> and then you see, you know, tea towel, 25 pounds for one. 
And then you see, you know, screen print of, of the work in miniature or, you know, or, or a scaled down version that's, you know, 50, 100, 200 pounds. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll buy the postcard. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just put that in my fridge and, and that will have to do. So this is the workhorse tea towel. I didn't even purchase it new. It was given to me by my grandma because she was clearing out her cupboard. Or rather, I was clearing it out for her. Um, and it got a hole in it. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure that the way it got a hole in it was that it was wrapping, I wrapped something in it such as knives or cutlery, maybe to take out for a picnic or something, and the knife just poked straight through, and the hole was getting quite a lot bigger. And you know what they say, stitch in time saves nine. It's very true. Um, so the way that I fixed it was that I took a piece of pre-made cotton tape, I put that there, and I folded down the edges and um, the top two edges so that it wouldn't fray and then the side selvages are are just woven in so there's no raw edge there and I just I just stitched it down um, and then I sewed up and down back and forth along the weave of the tea towel in order to strengthen the hull and I think it's worked quite nicely and it's a tiny tiny little mend um, and if anything, I think it adds a little bit of character to my tea towel, to my nondescript tea towel. So it's just a little mend on my nondescript tea towel and it just allows it to continue serving me and serving its function. And um, here's, the, here's the cotton tape that I use and actually this was salvaged as well because I just ripped this off an old twirl that I'd made. So it's a, a mend of something secondhand using a secondhand mending material. Um, and for me, that's kind of what it's all about, really. Things don't necessarily have to be flashy, and things, I, I'm certainly someone that sees the value in things being quite worn. Okay, um, the next thing I want to mention is these spring flower socks that I showed off last week as a finished object. And I spoke quite a lot about how I was experimenting with the yarn, with the gauge, with the stitch pattern, and that it turned out a little bit loose. So these were knit in tuku wool sock, which is another Finnish sock yarn, but a two-ply woolen spun, non-superwash sock yarn. And I, I produced this fabric that I was quite happy with, but was quite loose. And then I wore them around and I had said to you on the, on the video that, oh, I'll, I'll just see if it felts up a little bit through wearing. Then I put it in the washing machine. <laughs> And I did put it on a delicate setting and I did put it in a laundry bag, a delicate laundry bag, on a cold, you know, on a cool wash with a very, very minimal spin. And I took it out and they had shrunk. Ah! <laughs> and they're super, they've super fuzzed up. Um, they look quite nice on camera actually. So what I think I'll do is I'll remeasure the gauge and then have another think about this pattern. Um, and I'm definitely going to be only hand washing these in the sink from now on because they were slightly on the large side and now they've just, you know, sucked up to my foot size a bit, but they cannot afford to get any smaller. And I'm just bringing these back on to another video to show you because I think it's really important to highlight the, the circular nature of clothing and of knitting. You know, something goes off of our needles, but it doesn't, it doesn't just go into the void. It goes into the wardrobe, it goes into the laundry, it goes back into the mending pile, goes round and round. Maybe you lose one sock, maybe the other one goes down the back of the sofa. Um, you know, these objects keep becoming present and stay present in our lives when we've made them. Unless we give them away and then steal them back off our siblings. <laughs> Conversational threads. So now, again, accompanied by some cold tea, I'd like to bring up um, some more things to chat about. So firstly, um, in order to stimulate some more conversation, I'd like to, to introduce um, a poet to you on my channel, a posthumous poet, and read a couple of quite inspiring pieces of her writing from one essay. And the poet is, is no one underground or unknown at all. It's the incredible late poet, Audre Lorde, 
who was so influential in critical race studies, in black feminist writing, in lesbian feminist writing, in black lesbian feminist writing. Um, so, so, so influential. And I'm speaking to you now on a personal level, um, but also I'm, I'm bringing in a little bit of the ha various hats that I wear for my day job, which is um, as a PhD student. And I'm working in, in post-colonial studies and diaspora research, and Audre Lorde is someone whose writing is, is therefore very, very familiar to me, um, both in its own original form, but also in the way that she has inspired countless other academics, researchers, teachers, and, and like myself, students. And the, um, the essay that I'm going to read a little bit for you from now is, is again, it's really polemical, it's really famous, but if you haven't heard of it, it's, this, is, this is really why I'm, I'm bringing it into, into the video, um, so that I've got a chance to share with you something that is, is, yeah, it's just the most amazing, moving piece of writing. And the essay is called The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. Um, and it was written in 1984. It's written as a speech to, to address the attendees of a, of a feminist conference. And it's freely available online and you can also find it in collected um, editions of her writings, of her essays and, and of her poems because she's very much a poet and the lyrical quality of her writing comes into absolutely everything that she does. Um, so yeah, this is a speech. I will, I will include the, the PDF um, that this is printed from in the show notes just underneath this video. And there's a few um, points here that I like to share with you because they are about the notion of difference. Difference between, differences between women, differences between people. And I think she does speak quite a lot of the fundamental difference between men's experiences and women's experiences. And obviously, you know, this was written in 1984. Whilst it is of a piece of its time, it's also, in my opinion, completely relevant today. So, meditating on difference inspired by Audre Lorde. So I'm, I'm reading from her essay, which I've printed on the back of my knitting pattern to save paper, um, but also to... I think it's a good demonstration of the fact that, you know, theory, theory and practice, theory and practice are always together. So what she says is, advocating the mere tolerance of difference between women is the grossest reformism. It is a total denial of the creative function of difference in our lives. I think that's really interesting. The creative function of difference. Continuing. Quote. Difference must not be merely tolerated, but seen as a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. Um, she continues, within the independency of different strengths, acknowledged and equal, can the power to seek new ways of being in the world generate, as well as the courage and sustenance to act where there are no charters. Um, so, I, I think that as, as women and knitters, um, and women knitters, because I'm, you know, there, there are male knitters, obviously, but my interaction has been overwhelmingly female, you know, women of different class backgrounds, women, you know, and income streams, women of different ethnic backgrounds, different language abilities, um, different location in the world, completely different political views, but my experience has overwhelmingly been that knitters are women. Lots of men in my experience are extremely enthusiastic and supportive about the craft of knitting, but generally it seems to, in my experience, it's reminded them of other women in their lives. Um, there's, there's certainly a long history of male knitting, especially in um, well, in cold places, you know, in the north, in the north of England, um, in Scotland, um, but knitting, in my experience, has been really overwhelmingly female. And actually, everybody that's reached out to me through the videos, um, both on YouTube and elsewhere on Instagram and Ravelry, have all been women too. And I think that that's really interesting. Um, it doesn't mean that the space is closed down. 
Um, it means it can be opened up. Oh, one more point of difference that I should have added to the list earlier was um, gender and sexuality. I think that that has always, from, from, from my experience of knitting, especially learning to knit 15 years ago when it was really sparking online, um, queerness and genderqueer and alternative ways of, of living, so-called alternative lifestyles, were super embodied into the DIY punk craft kind of aesthetic, as well as the, in my opinion, feminist project of reclaiming the domestic tea towel um, <laughs> and seeing value in everyday craft. So that's difference. Um, so to continue on Audre Lorde, she's saying, she wrote, as women, we have been taught either to ignore our differences or view them as causes for separation and suspicion, rather than as forces for change. Without community, there is no liberation, only the most vulnerable and temporary armistice between an individual and her oppression. But community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. Um, and wow, in my opinion, that really says it all in terms of what our lives are and also in terms of what we in our lives can bring to our craft and what through our craft we can bring to community in person, so important that it's in person as well as online. And sort of seeing online spaces also as a way to reflect the personal spaces that we would bring. And I've seen that quite a lot on the internet recently, you know, people saying, Oh, uh, you know, my video, as my video, you know, is is my living room. I, I would expect discussions to continue in that manner, as if I'd literally invited people into my home. Um, so for me, this is a really, this is a really great reminder of, you know, other work that I myself have done at work, you know, for my work. Um, and there's a phrase in diaspora and hybridity studies called togetherness and difference togetherness and difference and I think that that is that is really really important I think we mustn't assume that we have all had exactly the same experiences because it's not going to be the case and I touched on this um, on my last video when I was talking about income streams and and disposable income and how we approach craft knitting and DIY making in our own individual lives um, I think that there is space for everything. I think that there, there is more than enough space um, for all kinds of different approaches which exist. I also really want to reiterate that whilst I've just said that, you know, online spaces are a reflection of our real life, they're not, you know, think about it literally, they're 2D, so they're not a full reflection. They're just a minuscule record, it's a slice. Um, how people choose to present themselves online is a choice. Um, sometimes it's an unconscious choice, but it is a choice because it doesn't show the full picture and it never can. And this is something that I think is really, really worth reiterating, um, especially in this, you know, super, super early stage of me making videos on YouTube. What we see online isn't everything. Um, to just finish one little last piece of reading of Audre Lorde before I continue. So she continues, those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. And, end quote, really, again, this is such an amazing, not so much call to arms, but call to action. Um, I find that when you read a lot of, well, when I read a lot of critical race studies and other work on race and ethnicity, and just history actually, full stop, it can be super demoralizing. Um, it, it can make you really despair for the state of the world, you know, in terms of the things, things that have happened and, and sort of wondering if we can ever affect any kind of real change. And when I read Audre Lorde, it's so deeply personal in the most transformative way that is is so affirmative, inspiring, and make makes you feel like, you know, you can you can go out there and live differently. You can make different choices. You can affect change. Um, 
in, in, in whatever sphere it is, however large or small. Um, so putting her away, but I will, I will leave the link to this PDF that's available freely online for you to peruse the essay. Um, I haven't actually touched upon the core moment of this text, but readings of this, you know, deconstructions of this are available online. And I'll also include um, a couple of links for a very, very brief biography of her and introduction to her works. Her writing is so just stunning. Um, and she's she's written, you know, not not only about experiences of race, although that comes into everything that she does, um, but also really touchingly about motherhood um, and you know family and loss and also experiences of cancer, which is just incredibly, incredibly, incredibly moving. So continuing on from that and mediating on difference, um, Thank you. Thank you uh, to everybody that's watching now and to everybody that saw the first video, to everybody that commented and reached out to me on YouTube, on Instagram, uh, sent me a personal message. It's just amazing. Um, I really didn't, I really didn't expect it. Um, and also thank you for being so respectful, being so overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, I've just been ruminating more on difference, but People have said to me, oh, I totally get where you're coming from. I feel this way, I feel that way because of my personal circumstances. People have been really generous to share, share little anecdotes, share how they do things. Um, and also for other people who do not want to spend their time mending a tea hole in a tea towel because <laughs> they don't want to buy a new one. You know, that's also fine because we all make different choices and different priorities in our lives. And, as I said before, I think that there is room for that in knitting internet where I seem to be residing at the moment. Um, I have a lot of ideas for how to grow this channel and I'm really excited about implementing them for you. My question to you is, um, where do you like to interact online? Please let me know in the comments below because um, I find that the comments method on YouTube is quite good for a kind of back and forth thing. Um, Instagram is really awful for interacting. It's really difficult to keep track of comments and things kind of appear and disappear at different times. So my question to you is how do you like to interact on the internet and would you interact um, on Ravelry? Because I think the kind of more traditional old school format of the forum on Ravelry might be quite good for having conversations and for kind of tracking changes and seeing what people are up to in a slightly more static, slightly slower way so that the record then it exists. Because the trouble about Instagram is that stuff just, it just disappears. Um, and it's really, it's really difficult to use to have a conversation, to have, to kind of follow a thread because, you know, in terms of like the notifications pop up and the likes pop up and the comments pop up kind of all simultaneously and it becomes this mesh of, of stuff on my phone. And also I feel like it's very, you know, like this, like scroll, 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 and I get very in, engrossed in the screen here. Um, whereas maybe on Ravelry, there's the opportunity to kind of sit back and look at it on a, on a computer screen in, in a not more distant, but maybe slightly more balanced way. So please let me know if you would um, consider joining a Ravelry group. Um, thank you so much to everybody who subscribed. Thank you for everyone who has been spreading the word in different ways. Um, I really appreciate it. And I would really love to do some kind of um, pride straw and giveaway um, when we reach some kind of milestone. So I'm wondering if we could reach the milestone of a thousand subscribers here on the YouTube channel. And then I'll start thinking about some kind of um, prize draw that I, I'd love to involve um, and give to you guys. So I think that's it for this episode of the Crimson Stitchery. Please do leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you think about um, how you're integrating mending a bit more into your routines, if you might kind of use this video as a way to interact and, and stimulate in the way that I'm doing. Let me know where you'd like to have online conversations. Would you use Ravelry? Are you interested um, in 
kind of building up all of these conversations a little bit more. Um, again, thank you so much for your support. Thank you for watching. Um, I know that that's kind of something that you hear quite a lot in podcast and, and Instagram world, but I really do mean it because I, I didn't have very many expectations um, when, I, when I started this. As I said, my friends just kept trying to persuade me to do it and I thought, oh, I'll just give it a go. Um, and the response has, has been really overwhelmingly positive um, and really generous as well. So I really do mean thank you. So find me on Ravelry and on Instagram as a sour telling. That's a sour telling. And until next time, happy knitting.